Uh, I'd like to welcome everyone to what will be a very enriching discussion. Uh, today is the launch of the report by Positive Money uh, on the Green Central Banking uh, Scorecard, which I look at with great interest. And I think uh, everyone joining this meeting is going to look at with very much of interest. We all know the role that central banks can play uh, in supporting the green transition. Uh, I would like to welcome Zach Livingstone, who is a senior researcher uh, at Positive Money and is a lead co-author co of the report. So Zach, over to you to present the finding. Uh, thanks very much. Um, so hello, everyone. Uh, we're pleased to be launching the Green Central Banking Scorecard for 2024. This is the third report in the series and uses an updated methodology to rank G20 central banks and supervisory institutions on their progress towards green central banking. The report makes the case for these institutions to take further actions on climate change and puts forward the leading examples of green policy for others to follow. We also highlight the policy gaps that the high ranking countries need to act on to further improve their scores. I'll begin with a quick overview of the structure of the scorecard itself and then talk through the new rankings and themes we've chosen uh, to focus on in the new report. Uh, I'll also review the updated recommendations we have put forward for central banks and supervisors before we move to our panel discussion. The scorecard has four categories, research and advocacy, monetary policy, uh, financial policy, and leading by example. Institutions score points for green policies and actions they've taken that come under these categories. All the categories have a maximum point limit. So in order to achieve a high overall grade, institutions need to perform well across all four categories. We also limit the number of points that can be gained for minor actions, such as reports and speeches, and award the most points for really high impact actions that actively shift the natural flows away from fossil fuel activity and towards the green transition. We've reviewed the structure of the scorecard so um, we can reflect on the 2024 rankings, which will be uh, uh, visible shortly. We can have them up in the call. Um, so the uh, European Union and EU member countries have taken the top four positions in this vision, uh, followed by Brazil and China. These countries have made strong progress in financial policy, but some significant gaps remain in monetary policy. It's important to note that the bulk of progress made by France, Germany, and Italy comes from actions taken at the EU level, which are the most important in terms of the total score. The actions taken by the individual member countries cause small differences in the scores, which are decisive in terms of their relative ranking, but less important for the absolute score. France has secured first place, just ahead of Germany. Uh, highlights include the Bank of France formally committing to a responsible investment charter for its non-monetary portfolios, which we like. Um, the charter uh, includes explicit exclusionary policies for fossil fuels and achieves high impact status as a result. And that's a real kind of difference maker that puts like, France at the top, um, but only, only, only by a hair, really. Um, and then Germany is coming second with progress, including a sustainable investment framework for its foreign reserves and the development of an in-house macro model that considers physical and transition risks within a double materiality analysis. And I, across the EU countries, that kind of embracing of double materiality is really like a positive sign and falls in line with the recommendations we make for wider for the G20 um, in this report. Okay, Italy um, has placed third. Uh, the Bank of Italia has been notably active at the EU level uh, contributing expert input to a wide range of discussions and processes in support of advancing green policy. Um, I think uh, especially the uh, potential introduction of a sectoral systemic risk buffer was good to see, and the climate-related capital-based uh, measures that have been discussed with the EPA. We encourage the Bank of Italia to continue working uh, with the core EU institutions to drive further progress at the EU level, especially on the monetary policy side, but also to consider what more could be done at the national level, which would then um, like potentially push them a little bit further up in future, um, even though third place is still very good, very good rating. Uh, then we move to the European Union, uh, which is placed fourth um, with a final grade that reflects the actions taken specifically by the ECB and EBA. So not the member countries' um, national level actions, this is purely the EU level. Uh, we've seen the ECB taking a range of positive actions in the financial policy category, 
uh, such as system-wide climate stress tests, um, which does annually, and requiring banks to meet the ECB's supervisory expectations on climate by the end of 2024. However, we've yet to see the EU and its member states implementing the high impact monetary policy needed to achieve an A rank. The central banks of France, Germany, and Italy should turn their attention to this category in the future, as should the ECB and EBA, in order to close this important policy gap. Uh, looking beyond the EU, um, uh, two other kind of high performing countries in this uh, scorecard are Brazil and China. So, um, Brazil has uh, a ban on financing for sugarcane crop expansion in the Amazon, um, uh, environmental compliance and rural credit, and pillar two capital requirements for banks with poor management of climate and nature risks. Um, also of note is EcoInvest Eco Brazil, which is an initiative uh, of the Brazilian government, but the uh, central bank is also involved, and it's designed to attract private investment with a um, uh, just a, to uh, drive ecological transformation of the country, um, essentially. Um, so that, that's, um, we're kind of watching that to see how that unfolds. At the moment, that's got a formal commitment status in the, in the scorecard, and we're excited to see whether it lands at the kind of high or medium impact level, depending on how it's kind of rolled out. Then um, turning to China, uh, the People's Bank of China has extended the carbon emission reduction facility, the SURF, to the end of 2027, which requires banks to offer reduced rates for green loans, environmental protection, and infrastructure, and renewable energy. They also withdrew the special coal lending facility at the end of 2023. However, there are concerns that support for coal lending may continue under other policies it has in operation. So we'd like to see the People's Bank of China exclude coal across its operations in accordance with a robust, unsustainable taxonomy and really commit to the move away from coal and other fossil fuels. Uh, other countries that have made progress since the previous edition of the scorecard are Japan, Indonesia, India, Australia, and South Africa. All of these countries have improved their scores over time and are set to continue improving if they follow through on their commitments. Japan is particularly promising due to its innovative monetary policy approach, but unfortunately has fallen short of the higher ranks because these policies have not yet been scaled up enough to achieve their full potential. Uh, the rest of the G20 are falling behind on green central banking. The UK and Canada have stalled on progress since the last report, and the institutions in the remaining countries are either failing to follow through on the climate commitments they've made before, or like avoiding making commitments in the first place. Uh, the lack of action by the US Federal Reserve and the United States generally stands out as a global cause for concern. The United States is the highest emitting country in terms of fossil fuels and cement use, the second highest emitted by land use and forestry, and even after adjusting for population size, it remains the second highest emitter globally. However, it has only managed to rank 17th among the G20. This is despite the significant monetary and financial advantages the US has at the international level, such as the US dollar acting as the world's reserve currency. As a result, this report shines a light on the Fed as the country, uh, as the the institution with the greatest responsibility among the G20 institutions to take action on green central banking. We'd like to see the institution's leading scorecard call on the Fed directly to follow their lead and begin to close the gap. The report also reflects on the differences between G20 countries' historical responsibility for climate change and the different challenges they face in actually implementing green policy. At the global level, central banking is not happening on a level playing field. Some countries are in a better position to take action, and are in a better position to support other countries in the global effort to transition to a green economy. While all the G20 institutions have a responsibility to play their part, the report calls on the countries most responsible for climate breakdown to support those worst affected by the crisis today and achieve a just transition. That brings us to the recommendations made in the new report. The recommendations from the previous report have been carried through to the new edition as they remain relevant for many institutions in 2024. We've also added three new recommendations. Firstly, central banks should recognize that achieving inflation targets requires taking action against climate inflation, so inflation driven by climate change. Specifically, they need to account for, account for climate and nature, nature risks within inflation forecasting and adopt the new tools required to mitigate these risks. Secondly, coordination with governments to increase fiscal space for green, for green public investment is needed. To respond effectively to the climate crisis, we need to see public funds being channeled towards green projects. 
Thirdly, institutions must re re develop robust taxonomies that draw a clear line between unsustainable and sustainable activity. These should classify economic activities and financial assets according to their degree of environmental harm. Robust taxonomies can be used to guide other impactful green policies and ensure they are implemented effectively and consistently at full scales. These new recommendations complement the long-standing recommendations of the scorecard project. We hope to see more central banks and supervisory institutions following these recommendations and progressing towards green central banking. I will now hand back to Sarah Dali and we can move to the panel discussion. Thank you very much, Deborah. Thank you so much, Zach. Um, the green uh, central banking scorecard uh, provides a snapshot of what's happening across the world. We all know that G20 is extremely important in terms of driving change because it accounts for about 80% of CO2 emissions, it accounts for 85% of the world GDP. And if at all anything needs to change, it requires public finances and government action and central banks are at the heart of it. So any transition at the central bank level could mean that finances could flow to sectors and to activities which are aligned with transition. And what we have today is a panel where we have experts from countries that have figured uh, well on that scorecard. Um, I would love to introduce our uh, panelists today, all with very long experience uh, with central banks and monetary policy. I'd first like to welcome uh, Emmanuel Aswan. Uh, she's the General Financial Stability and Operations Chair at Banque de France. Very nice to meet you, Emmanuel. And she's been in Banque de France for a long time. Uh, has been working as the chair of the um, uh, you know, of the of the Climate Change Center. Uh, I would also like to welcome uh, David Sal Sales de Barros Valente. He's a senior advisor for prudential regulation at the Central Bank of Brazil. A very warm welcome to you, David. Um, I believe um, Sarah was to join us. Um, I don't see her on the screen, but I um, just mentioned that Sarah, is a, Sarah Bloom Raskin is a distinguished professor of uh, practice of law at Duke Law School and formal former Federal Reserve Board member. So if she does join us shortly, then uh, we will in introduce her to the discussion. So Emmanuel, starting with you, um, uh, Banque de France uh, scores really well on, on the scorecard. Uh, we've seen that there's been quite a bit of action. Um, Zach mentioned that there's been the responsible uh, investor charter, which in, of course you know has an exclusion uh, around fossil fuels, the funding of fossil fuels. Uh, there's also been an important role for Banque de France in the NGFS discussions uh, where, you know, there's been a movement towards nature-based uh, disclosures. While we see all of that happening, um, on the monetary policy side, we see that the, the leap made by Banque de France is not as much as on the financial policy side. So I'd like for you to reflect on the progress as well as on what you think is the scope for improvement uh, on the monetary policy side to align it with the with the goals of transition. Over to you, Manu. Thank you very much, uh, Swanjili, and uh, many thanks. I'm very proud to uh, represent uh, Banque de France uh, in this forum, and I'm very proud that we rank uh, as the first central bank uh, in, in this list. Um, it's a uh, 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 well, it's a responsibility that we uh, collectively share and uh, here in Banque de France and in ACPR, uh, the authority in charge with uh, supervision of banks and insurers. And um, please be reassured that uh, there is a, a, a very strong involvement of a lot of people uh, in, in the, and this score, I think, reflects as well this involvement. So um, as far as what um, has been uh, maybe the, the main uh, improvements uh, over the last uh, two years uh, and uh, what can be uh, uh, put forward, um, I think it's uh, in the remit of um, the supervisory practices that it is uh, the most um, uh, straightforward. Uh, we have had a, a lot of... Uh, regulatory uh, developments at the European level with all the different uh, regulatory requirements as far as disclosures, as far as um, pillar free uh, related disclosures for banks and insurers. 
Um, that's quite an achievement, which has no uh, type of comparison uh, elsewhere with the different uh, uh, CSDD, uh, D, so the due diligence uh, directive on corporate sustainability, which is the latest text, but also the CSRD, which is corporate sustainability requirements uh, um, uh, directive, the SFDR, which is for the, the financial system, uh, the same type of uh, uh, disclosure requirements. So uh, the um, uh, governments with the European at the European level have made a great job uh, during the, the latest years, and uh, it is being uh, implemented. And we are looking at uh, what it gives uh, from the implementation perspective in our role of uh, supervisor. But we have also progressed uh, in a parallel track from a supervisory perspective, uh, developing a lot of different tools uh, in our uh, supervisory toolbox from a banking and insurers uh, perspective uh, su supervisor, uh, with the first stress test being developed in ACPR, uh, in the French uh, Supervisory Authority in 2020, 21, uh, being uh, done now on a regular basis by uh, the SSM, the Single Shared Mechanism for banks, uh, the largest banks in uh, the European, uh, at the Euro area level. And uh, lastly, um, uh, a cross-sectoral stress test uh, with the fit for 55, uh, you know, uh, impact analysis in order to see how uh, the objectives of uh, the fit for 55 uh, regulation uh, will impact uh, the financing sector. We do a lot of things. We do also uh, on-site inspections. We have um, developed some uh, uh, supervisory expectations at the ECB level as well. And it's uh, a lot of areas of progress, uh, which is very material. But we have also lagged uh, uh, in some areas. Uh, the standards at the international level are still fragmented. Uh, we have a little bit of a, still a problem, which is related to monetary policy, as you were mentioning, uh, which is the fact that we have still to bridge the gap with the real economy transition planning and what we do at the financial uh, system level. We have to, to make it uh, very well coordinated with what is happening at the uh, uh, real economy level. And we have to better uh, identify the sectoral pathways. It's a lot of work that we have to engage in with the real economy. And still, uh, we know for sure, and for sure because it's uh, it has been uh, uh, um, the object of uh, in-depth diagnosis that we have, um, you know, uh, uh, blind spots when it comes to nature, and that the interaction between uh, degradation of nature and climate change is uh, very strong, and we know that we have to act in, a, you know, on both sides as a parallel uh, uh, pillars, and that we are uh, lagging in that uh, on that nature uh, aspect. So here. Um, Monetary policy, we certainly can do more, and we have a, a lot of things uh, undergoing, but it's because the context, including with uh, real economy, uh, is uh, a little bit uh, uh, to be worked out further from our perspective. I stop here. Thank you so much, Emmanuel. Just picking up from what you've mentioned, I think it's really important to tie in the real economy to the financial system. And what you mentioned next is on the on, on nature and its impact uh, on banking. And that leads me to you, David. Um, you know, for Brazil, uh, nature-based disclosures, uh, nature-based uh, you know, risks are actually very important. I want to pick up from the report. Um, you know, it, uh, Zach did mention about the Eco-Invest program, which in a sense brings together, uh, you know, public sort of thinking around bringing private investments to ecological transformation. Uh, there's also been, uh, you know, implementation of pillar two requirements for poor performing banks. I just want to get a sense from you, David, on what other tools and the mandates that are available to central banks uh, to address climate and ecological uh, breakdown and, you know, what is it that Brazil is doing uh, to address these concerns? Thank you, Surinjali. Good afternoon, everybody. 
Well, the Central Bank of Brazil has been dealing with this, this subject since 2014. In 2014, we introduced regulation uh, requiring financial institutions to implement uh, risk uh, management for social and environmental risk, as well as to, to implement a, uh, a policy, responsibility policy uh, on social and environmental issues. In 2020, uh, the Central Bank of Brazil introduced uh, sustainability as a pillar on its institutional agenda. And as a, as a result of it, we, promote, prom, uh, we promoted uh, improvements both on the regulation uh, of financial institutions and uh, in the, the central bank itself, the role of central bank itself in the financial system. The, the risk, uh, risk management requirements were improved to include climate risk and to, and to give a better definition of social risk, environmental risk, and climate risk, and as well as in, in introducing specific requirements for management of those risks. We also improved uh, the responsibility uh, policy uh, that banks must implement to include uh, climate, climate issues, uh, in addition to social and environmental. And we also, in this opportunity, introduced uh, a requirement for financial institutions to disclose uh, a report on, the, on risk uh, and opportunities related to social, environmental, and climate-related issues. We treat these risks uh, uh, jointly, the, cl the climate risk, the social risk, and the environmental risk. Each one has it, its definitions and requirements and regulation. And the central bank, uh, the role of the central bank also, uh, the central bank also provides and leads by example by uh, disclosing uh, a, a report, a annual report on risks and opportunities faced by the central bank itself in, uh, regarding social, environmental, and climate related issues. And uh, with respect to tools uh, available for central banks, they are the, the, the traditional. Uh, in my understanding, the traditional tools available for prudential uh, treatment in general. I'm, by that, I mean uh, risk management uh, uh, requirements uh, in order to, to address uh, these, these climate risk, uh, basically, but also, in our case, social risk and environmental risk, which involves nature and, and everything. We also have a capital requirements uh, to introducing some kind of capital requirements to exposures to climate risk or to environmental risk or to social risk. And lastly, we, we the central bank has a, a tool uh, uh, in the form of limits, establishing limits to the exposure of financial institutions to each one of these risks. I think the combination of these tools uh, gives the central banks adequate and sufficient uh, capability to deal with uh, the, the, these, uh, these risks and these issues. Thank you very much, David. I think uh, what you raise is, you know, um, uh, improvements or innovations that uh, the Central Bank of Brazil has undertaken is in line with a lot of the things that the report recommends, especially in terms of capital requirements. Um, just to sort of, um, dwell a bit, little bit more on, on the monetary policy side. So is it, uh, is it that Bank of Brazil is thinking about or is already looking at economy-wide stress tests? Um, is it looking at uh, you know, targeting inflation based on uh, climate-based effects? What has been the progress on that side or are, are we seeing something in the offing in Brazil? Well, uh, the Central Bank of Brazil has already been uh, has already introduced uh, stress test analysis uh, performed by the Central Bank itself, and requires banks uh, banks to perform a stress test analysis. Uh, and this these stress tests is included in risk management requirements, and these these requirements are applied uh, in a proportional way according to the size of institutions. Uh, so the largest institutions are required to perform uh, three, three uh, kinds of, of stress tests. 
that involve uh, involving uh, uh, climate risk, social risk, and environmental risk, while the, the smaller banks are required to 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 perform uh, only a sensitivity uh, uh, test. That's really good to know. Um, it seems that there is also a differential treatment of small banks versus uh, large banks. So it's good thinking yes. by the central bank. Good to know. So going back to you, Emmanuel, uh, you know, I've read elsewhere uh, that you've spoken a lot about green securitization as one of and uh, one of the instruments that you think uh, which could be very useful for transition. Uh, I would really like to hear your view on how this works and how uh, you know central banks can push for this. While also, if you could, if you could think a little bit about and reflect on. Uh, where do you think a year from now would the momentum be since since France de France is, is a leading bank, uh, is at the forefront of supporting transition? Where do you see a year from now would banks be focusing on? Uh, what, where do you think the trust, trust would be uh, within EU and outside um, in terms of policy? So over to you, Manuel. Thank you very much. So on green securitization, that's an important topic uh, from our perspective, from a French and European perspective, because as you know, we have to uh, uh, fund large investments in terms of uh, uh, climate transition uh, in the coming, forthcoming years. And um, we uh, rely much in Europe, it's like 80% of the funding needs which have are covered by banking loans. Uh, so 20%, which is um, uh, market-based. Um, and uh, we have to act on two fronts uh, in order to uh, meet the funding needs for uh, a climate transition. First one is to, um, uh, to enhance uh, the market funding and to have a more integrated uh, capital market union, a savings and financing union in Europe, uh, where uh, the uh, excess savings of the Europeans, the private uh, saving, uh, excess saving, is uh, invested within Europe and not uh, outside. Uh, Europe, because we have a lot of uh, funding needs uh, to fund the transition. And here we have to uh, get um, uh, those savings uh, invested uh, inside Europe. But uh, we have to act as well on the capacity for banks to um, finance further, uh, provide additional funding to the real economy. And here, uh, even though there's a uh, very strong um, uh, and, uh, capital uh, basis uh, for the uh, European uh, banking system. Um, you know, there is always some leeway uh, which can be uh, 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 which can be um, delivered further, and we consider that securitization is still uh, too uh, little, uh, very poorly used in Europe, and which, uh, if more used, would provide a lot of more room for maneuver in order to uh, fund the transition. We have made some calculation where uh, actually if we um, securitize uh, like 20% of the balance sheet of the European banks, uh, so taking a lot of uh, buffers and leeway, uh, we could uh, meet uh, actually uh, the, the funding requirements for transition, um, which would be uh, of a great help, of course. We have a framework which is very sound as far as securitization. We know for sure from our perspective of uh, Banque de France that securitization in, is, in Europe is a very safe um, uh, um, uh, instrument because we make the assessment on behalf of the euro system from a monetary policy of the different uh, securitization that we take on as a collateral for monetary policy operations. So we make this assessment from a, an investor perspective and we take a large part of the securitization 
of, of, uh, of the market as a collateral uh, for monetary policy operations. So we know that they are very safe and we know have a framework which is um, the uh, green uh, EU green bond label, which authorize um, the capacity to uh, label as green securitization, uh, securitization which uh, as a use of, of proceed, invest more than 80% of the uh, use of proceed into um, uh, investments aligned with the EU taxonomy, which is great. So we have all the different blocks and we have a little bit of a problem there because there are still little issues and little uptake from the investors on securitization. And we have a sense that we have three problems. Disclosures is too important, too burdensome. And from an investor perspective that we are, we know for sure that there's almost like half percent, half, um, half, uh, um, of the requirements, disclosures requirements that are not relevant. We have also strong requirements from a prudential perspective, both from the issuer's side, which are the banks, and uh, so the originators, and on the investor side, which are mostly the insurers and pension funds. And we know that we could a little bit alleviate uh, the, the requirements, which are uh, a little bit uh, not proportional to the underlying risk. So here we have an agenda, uh, maybe with the next commission, to get a little bit of more proportionality in terms of risk for uh, securitization in order to propel a little bit securitization and a, as a means uh, to help uh, the transition. That's for securitization. Uh, when it comes to what we could do uh, uh, in addition, uh, to, uh, to that uh, for the next uh, year, we uh, consider that we have to address the gaps. Maybe it will not be that addressable in the forthcoming months, but we have to remain targeted on those objectives, the ones uh, related to nature, um, and maybe to start with uh, developing um, models which are more, uh, from a macroeconomic perspective, more adapted to, uh, in order to onboard the uh, financial and economic risks stemming for, from the deterioration of nature and the loss of biodiversity. We are not that there yet, but we have to work hard on that with academics, notably. Uh, so it's a call for uh, interest in, in that regard to work on that. Uh, maybe uh, jumping outside of uh, Europe and outside the academic sphere, going back to funding and financing problems, we have to uh, try to uh, address uh, the uh, financing, uh, the transition financing in emerging and developing countries, economies. Uh, it's important. We have like 25% uh, like of the GDP there in EMDEs, but only 10 to 15% of the uh, global climate financing flows, which go to uh, the EMDs. So there's a bridge that we, a gap that we should, uh, we should bridge uh, and also work more. Uh, and we have started to do so in the NGFS, more, work more on the adaptation issues. Um, even in the Paris-based, like 1.5 degrees uh, world, uh, if we manage to maintain that and to reach that, we will need adaptation. We already need adaptation. And there is not enough, uh, there is a, a, a funding gap which is quite huge still at this moment and not enough uh, uh, investments made in this uh, regard. So we have to work uh, on that and close that gap. Uh, we will publish uh, very soon, in the forthcoming months, a note in the NGFS in order to work on that uh, adaptation issues. So that's maybe a little bit of a program for the next uh, uh, months. Thank you so much, Emmanuel. Um, you know, we rarely talk about adaptation, always sort of focus on mitigation, especially, uh, you know, on, on the central banking side. So it's nice that you bring that up. and also about the bridging of the financing gap. 
and that brings me to David because uh, this is the year of Brazil's G20 presidency, um, and you know there is COP COP30, which will uh, which we look forward to greatly. Uh, what is it that you know we can expect that you know Brazil's contribution could be? Uh, what do we expect to see in terms of uh, you know sort of cutting edge innovations in this space of central banking and bank financing? David, you're on mute. I'm sorry. Uh, I think that in the, the in G20, in the, the COP30, uh, with Brazil presidency, we, we can hope to, to achieve some uh, consensus on the need to, to, to make uh, advance in, in, especially in, in, with regard to, to developed countries, uh, 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 reaching a uh, common taxonomy that would help uh, uh, addressing these problems uh, collectively. Uh, and we also could, could achieve some consensus in the need to uh, advance in, in disclosures, because this, this consensus we haven't reached yet. Uh, we are, as a central bank, uh, as a, a financial uh, regulator and supervisor, we rely on the standards issued by the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision. And uh, we, we have not uh, reached this consensus uh, in terms of this disclosure of, of information with respect to climate issues. Uh, we have uh, qualitative uh, information that to be disclosed and quantitative information to be disclosed. And uh, I think on the quantitative side, there's still uh, room for improvement. We haven't reached this consensus. And uh, this reflects uh, on the, the, the standard that Basel is currently discussing, uh, which uh, will uh, include uh, disclosures, will improve the pillar three disclosures, uh, and we will include climate disclosures. But so far, we, we, only, uh, we will only uh, demand or require uh, quanti quantitative uh, information uh, as mandatory and not quantitative information as mandatory. Quantitative will be optional. And uh, we hope to, to reach some consensus in this area uh, uh, based on a common taxonomy so that we could uh, achieve a level playing field in terms of information. And once this, 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 this step is concluded, we could discuss another step, which would be uh, capital requirements uh, on this, which is a, a, another step, uh, and even limits on, 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 on exposures, uh, bank exposures to climate, climate uh, risk. Thank you so much, David. Uh, this, again, sort of brings us back to Zach's uh, hard work in the report, uh, which basically uh, showcases as one of the recommendations is that there should be a taxonomy uh, on, on, on unsustainable activities. And so therefore, this is a shout out for your work uh, and the recommendations that you make. Sarah is not here, but I think, uh, you know, Emmanuel and David, you both are uh, experts in the space. And, uh, you know, I would like to ask you some questions on, uh, you know, the bit of international financing, because in the last one year, it's especially on, in India's G20 presidency. There was a lot of talk about uh, the reform of the MDPs. There was talk about uh, the use of special drawing rights as well as, uh, you know, concessional debt, something that, uh, you know, this report talks about, the scorecard report talks about as well. Um, as central bankers, um, what do you think is the potential for use of such instruments? Uh, particularly, you know, if you look at the report, it talks about how, um, you know, dollar lending is made across across the world um, and how some countries could be restricted to access and that could change the level playing field. So just a very broad question on, on what do you think is the potential for using uh, a you know dollar as a way of uh, you know if the, if the US central bank were to change the way it thinks, would that have ramifications for the international economy? How can uh, the dollar then influence change across the world? And of course, uh, you know, Leading from that, what do you do in terms of using instruments such as special drawing rights, uh, as well as concessional debt as options, uh, uh, you know, 
for financing and this would have of course effects on macroeconomic and financial stability so just your uh, you know broad reflections on on a very very broad question that i've asked us uh, so emmanuel first you and then david So maybe uh, I will uh, I will get to to that from my perspective, uh, which is uh, not the one of an expert in that regard, but um, on uh, the need to have a, a consistent uh, at the global level a consistent approach in terms of uh, climate transition and climate change. I think it it, it is um, very key uh, that we achieve that. We have some tools already with the ISSB uh, developing some international standards, getting to uh, close to a double materiality approach, which is uh, close to what we have developed in Europe. Um, we have some uh, uh, the achievements made in Europe. We have some agencies in the US working hard in order to uh, get to the same type of requirements vis-à-vis -vis the financial sector. I, I mean, the uh, SEC, uh, which has uh, delivered a lot, even if they can face a li little bit of uh, complex issues uh, in that regard. And uh, that's very good signals. Uh, what we need and what we see is that uh, from um, you know, uh, market-led initiatives, you have as well some very important American uh, actors in the financial system uh, with a large and global uh, footprint who can, uh, which act uh, in this regard and for which climate, uh, the climate risks are taken on board in order to uh, uh, frame uh, their risk management uh, framework which is very important from an asset management perspective, for instance. And uh, it has influence, including, well, in the US, that's for sure, considering the importance of the financial markets there, but also uh, in uh, the other countries, considering the influence of those actors, including in Europe. Uh, what I see as a, a, a sign of uh, relevance and uh, you know, market appetite in that regard is to come back to your question on securitization. Um, securitization is uh, in the world uh, originated when it is green securitization at 90% in the US. So uh, you might have some discrepancies, a lot of uh, you know, very dynamic uh, perspective market segment Let's see, uh, let's have a look at green securitization originated out of the US and very much less in Europe. That's quite a problem and elsewhere, but some lags uh, and some uh, inconsistencies in terms of uh, both uh, uh, regulatory and supervisory approach. But I note that the Fed as a banking supervisor has started not to make stress tests but uh, to make some impact analysis from a climate perspective, which is the first step uh, in terms of uh, you know, taking on board uh, the climate risk. Um, otherwise, as far as the, the funding perspective at the global level and the different instruments that could be used, and here I'm a little bit further away, I, I, we have had some very... Uh, 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 very uh, brilliant initiatives, the Bridgestone uh, initiative, um, the um, new global financing pact in Paris last year. Um, that's for sure the basis for an, an additional uh, you know, layer of willingness in order to address things at the right level and in order to share the burden adequately proportionate to the capacity of funding and to the, uh, you know, uh, contribution to, con past contribution to climate change. So uh, we see a very positive signs that this uh, um, discussion has started and uh, should deliver at one stage or the other. But I let Thank that you. comment. Thanks, Emmanuel. Um, David, just 
just want you to reflect a little bit more on the fact that uh, you're not putting you in the spot, but uh, you know, if the United States, as we've seen in the report, uh, hasn't acted as much uh, on the monetary policy and the financial policy side, um, you know, there would be you know effects or ramifications for the global economy. Uh, with Brazil leading on on the G20 side, what do you think? Uh, you know, could be the expected impact of such um, low low action or inaction at some level, and uh, you know, what could be done to mobilize? Uh, uh, you know, in in a sense, action on the part of uh, of US to bring change. Well, uh, Brazil in, in this role could uh, the first thing I, I could say it's it could lead by example, uh, and so we are committed to implementing uh, the S one and S two standards issued by ISSB as well as the standard which will be uh, uh, issued by the Basel Committee. And we will try to, to, to accommodate the difference between these two standards so that uh, uh, we could uh, follow both S2 and the, the standard which will be issued by the Basel Committee. But as, as Emmanuel said, I, I, I look for, from my perspective as a, a financial regulator and supervisor. Uh, lots of uh, there are many other agents involved in in this in this effort, and that's we can expect only that all these agents and all, all these countries acting in, in in acting together will somehow uh, convince uh, the American uh, regulators and supervisors and American authorities on the need to, to go along with all the other uh, members of G20. I think that's, that's all we can do. Thanks, David. Um, it sort of flips the way of thinking because it, uh, we usually believe that, you know, the change could come from the regulator side, but who knows, it could be the financial markets and the other agents which bring together change uh, uh, in the thinking of regulators in the US as well. And we could see uh, so some positive change over there. Just want to, uh, you know, quickly in terms of talking about the transition being not just about the financial system. Uh, we've spoken about nature, but there's also uh, the just angle to it, which is that there will be loss of livelihoods um, and there will be uh, loss of employment. And so what are central banks thinking about, um, you know, just transition? Is there is there anything in their policy which is uh, adapted around the achievement of a just transition? Uh, so, Emmanuel, would you like to go first? Um, yeah, thank you very much indeed. Um, so, on the transition, so um, the, the central banks and the supervisors they are not in the driving seat for supervisor uh, for uh, transition. Uh, that's the, the real um, signal that we need will come from an action, will come from the governments uh, with a price, price signal, having a, you know, uh, a carbon price at the adequate level to send the right signal to the different uh, um, uh, stakeholders, both in the real economy and uh, both corporates and households and both uh, uh, real economy and financial system. So that's the very, uh, and the investments, some choice will be made. So uh, governments are um, in the driving seat in, in that regard. But what we do, and David uh, uh, framed it very well, is uh, that we can help in order to, uh, to, uh, to steer uh, the transition and to uh, make some uh, you know, guardrails in, in that regard. So what we do, uh, of course, is from a financial stability perspective, see uh, whether we can cope you know, uh, pragmatically uh, with transition. The Fit for 55 you know, stress test exercise that have been uh, conducted uh, the, the, over the last year is such a type of exercise where we can send a signal from a banking insurers or markets authority that it is okay, we can go ahead, the uh, financial system can cope uh, with that. Um, we are doing 
also uh, a lot of uh, work uh, in terms of macroeconomics, uh, you know, uh, trying to measure the um, uh, impact of transition uh, in addition to physical risk, but it, it's a little bit more uh, complicated even for physical risk on the macroeconomics, you know, the GDP evolution, the inflation evolution. It's a lot of work, but we have started uh, with notably the NGFS scenarios to plug in uh, those scenarios, short-term scenarios, long-term scenarios, and to see with our macroeconomic models how it works uh, in that regard. So uh, in terms of transitions, uh, we, we can help on both um, financial stability front and, uh, and uh, monetary uh, policy. And what we need is, of course, transition planning requirements. We have the, those ones in Europe. That's great. Uh, considering the different uh, uh, um, regulatory requirements of disclosures in this regard. And in Banque de France, more particularly, we uh, consider that we have to help the non-financial corporates in this regard. And we are in the process of developing a climate indicator, which is uh, based on a transition assessment for each a uh, non-financial corporate that is uh, subject to this climate indicator, just to help them to uh, assess where they stand vis-à-vis -vis their uh, the sectoral pathway. And it's a very, um, you know, for small uh, enterprises, for small corporates, it's a very useful tool because uh, most of the time they are quite lost. And here we try to prov provide them with a tool for them to assess where they stand, if they are doing better, if well, they are lagging, if they are on the good trend, on the trend which is expected in order to fine tune their efforts. Um, so we are trying to do that with every type of tools uh, that we can develop, even create, uh, just in order to help for the transition planning, which in our, uh, uh, we trust is a key parameter and a key tool uh, to, to achieve uh, the, the Paris uh, goals. Thanks, Emmanuel. David, to you on uh, quickly on uh, you know achieving just transition. If anything, that Banco de Brazil, uh, do Brazil is thinking about. Oh, I totally agree with Emmanuel. Uh, the, the role of the central bank is more reactive than positive uh, with regard to to transition transition uh, uh, climate transition risk. And uh, uh, we uh, have established uh, requirements for the, the appropriate management of this risk, but we haven't uh, established requirements for transition plans per se. Of course, when you do uh, a, a proper management of, of climate risk, transition risk, you must rely on a plan, a transition plan. But there are no specific requirements with regard to this. We are we are working on this. We are participating on a group of the of FSB that discusses transition plans, and we may we may arrive in the in in, in establishing requirements uh, for transition risk with, with that will help the central bank uh, based on information of every plan that, that is that is made and submitted to the central bank to uh, uh, evaluate the macroeconomic uh, uh, implications of, of every every financial institution, every financial institution's plan. Thank you so much, David. Um, now I'm going to open it up to audience questions that few. Um, so I will address those which are not specifically to each of you, uh, with, to both of you, then you can, uh, you know, answer this briefly. Let's start with the first uh, question. Um, uh, the um, participant asks, what are the panelists' thought on the extent to which central bank in interventions in their own jurisdiction and globally adequately address the prevention of risk or rather still aim to address risk after it accumulates? Uh, Emmanuel, if you would like to quickly and briefly respond to this and then David. Um, I think that, that we are in the mountain set and in the uh, 
um, in the process of uh, considering the, uh, the future pathway of risk. Um, we have already a stock of risk, that's for sure. Um, you know, the carbon budget has been uh, quite uh, already uh, consumed versus the uh, Paris objectives. Um, we are close uh, to, uh, but all um, you know the different tools that we have developed since the inception of the NGFS and since the very start of the different work is to be forward-looking and to develop scenarios, not to uh, based our, to base our work on statistics. We we are used to use a statistics. That's how our models uh, have been developed for macroeconomics. It has been uh, the way we have developed uh, credit stress tests, liquidity stress tests. But here we have changed completely our um, mindset uh, with the, the development of forward-looking uh, scenarios, starting with long-term scenarios, uh, for supervisory uh, uh, purpose, uh, looking more particularly at transition uh, risk. And uh, now we, had the we are at the juncture where we need um, shorter, shorter term scenarios, just because we see that the transition is taking place and that the risks are materializing now, currently. We need to enhance the physical risk scenarios from a forward-looking perspective because we observe and we suffer from uh, physical shocks now and not in uh, 30 years. Uh, so we are already uh, on, in the mindset of being turned, and it's completely new. Huh? We have to reframe of our uh, completely our uh, logiciel in French. So uh, it's uh, it's a bright new type of uh, mindset into a forward-looking perspective. Uh, so and we, what we do is to prevent risks uh, to develop further, which could uh, harm both price stability. Uh, with our mandate of uh, uh, central bank uh, in charge with maintaining price stability. So being in a position to uh, see and observe and assess how uh, climate change will develop an impact in, on uh, have impact on inflation, but also prevent that the financial system is impeded to, uh, uh, to service the real economy because it will be overburdened by uh, uh, um, by uh, loans, uh, defaulting loans, uh, by uh, stranded assets, uh, which would capture all the capital, not having uh, enough room for maneuver to grant uh, uh, credit or uh, funding to the real economy, which needs for uh, to develop and including to uh, develop the transition. So here it's uh, part of uh, preventing the risks now, in order to ensure that the financial system will be uh, there uh, to uh, maintain its uh, financing services, which are key for the real economy. Uh, that's why we have uh, um, requirements on transition planning for banks, requirements on adequate governance, a lot of expectations in this regard. That's why we are developing stress tests stress testing and that's why when banks are not compliant with the expectations they have some important fines uh, which can amount to a very large uh, amount compared to their uh, um, uh, revenues uh, so uh, it's forward looking and it's prevention based on the necessity to uh, tackle risks stemming from climate change David over to you well, I totally agree with the Banyard once more. Uh, central banks, as I mentioned earlier, has three tools to uh, address risks that uh, stem from, from uh, financial uh, activities. They can uh, establish requirements for risk management, and these can be debatable, stronger requirements for uh, uh, very detailed. Banks can, uh, central bank can uh, impose uh, capital requirements for banks for that you know, on their exposures to, to, for instance, climate risk. 
and banks can, uh, central banks can impose limits on exposure by, by banks, by financial institutions to climate risks. The, 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 the question is how to, to combine these three tools and how to, to achieve the correct, uh, the fine tuning of these uh, three tools in order not to, to hinder financial intermediation. And this is, has to be made ongoing. It's an ongoing effort. But uh, it's, it's a role that central banks will have to learn uh, how to use these three tools. And uh, uh, once more, in order not to hinder financial intermediation and, and with, it, with consequences to, to real economy. Thanks, David. There's a follow-on question for you. Um, another participant asks if you know they could get a more detail. Uh, they get more details on what uh, Banco de Brazil is planning on capital requirements. Um, what assets are going to be subject to capital requirements, and what kind of risk uh, weighting is being considered? Well, Brazil is a member of the Basel Committee, and all our. Uh, 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 prudential framework is based on other recommendations. And so we have capital requirements for, for credit risks, for, for market risk, for operational risk, according to the standards issued by Basel. Basel has not yet reached a consensus on the, on the uh, need to, to impose capital requirements on uh, uh, climate risks. And so Brazil, uh, as a member of Basel Committee, uh, will wait uh, and see if this consensus is reached and how Basel will, will finally, eventually uh, deal with this, this issue. And uh, whatever uh, recommendation Basel issues in terms of capital requirement, Brazil certainly will follow. But at the moment, we, we, we are not discussing a specific capital requirements uh, on uh, climate risk. We have on, we have uh, already imposed requirement, requirements on uh, climate risk management, and we have uh, uh, established a, a report on on risk treatment on qualitative uh, uh, issues, qualitative information, and we are currently working on. Uh, improving this, this report to include quantitative requirements to be disclosed by banks. Uh, once more, uh, trying to align both with S2 standard of the ISSB and the Basel standard, which is currently being discussed and will shortly be, be, be issued. Thank you. So, Anjali, maybe just something uh, on that one uh, from a European uh, Euro area uh, perspective. Um, uh, just like uh, David in Brazil, we don't have any type of uh, capital requirements from a level one perspective. So uh, there is nothing in the CRR, Capital Requirements Regulation, uh, Europe, you know, uh, defining the need for uh, you know some type of capital uh, uh, requirements uh, attached to, to such and such uh, assets from a climate perspective. Nevertheless, you have an additional layer, layer which is a, a pillar two uh, from a supervisory approach, uh, which has been developed and which encapsulates now uh, in Europe. Um, some type of capital requirements, the additional capital requirements stemming from the Pillar 2, the SREP, where you can have some capital requirements. Uh, let's say if you have a, a bank whose uh, business model is uh, uh, you know, based uh, on uh, developing only uh, coal mining, which is now... <laughs> Uh, you know, being reduced in Europe and being uh, uh, winded down. Obviously, there is a problem and there's some need to have some signals there that the bank should realign its business model. And here we can use uh, those um, uh, requirements which stem from the pillar two. But otherwise, the main thing is to have some uh, requirements from a government perspective, which is more like 
pillar three, our disclosure perspectives are, but if we don't have the right governance, it will uh, feed back into uh, SREP uh, requirements, so the pillar two uh, requirements. So we have capacity to make some, uh, you know, additional capital requirements based on a judgment and uh, on a pillar two, a pillar two approach. Emmanuel is right. Brazil also does that. We don't have a specific uh, requirement on pillar one, but on pillar two, uh, larger banks in Brazil are required, according to the Basel framework, to perform a internal capital adequacy assessment program. And in this assessment, they are required to, to evaluate, to assess all risks that they, are, they incur, including climate risk. And if this, the result of this assessment indicates that the bank should uh, allocate a specific amount of capital uh, for, for climate risk, then in uh, this, this exercise of uh, internal adequacy assessment is discussed with regulators and supervisors so that they can reach a, a common uh, uh, understanding of what is the necessary level of capital uh, from a bank considering all risks incurred and not only those of pillar one. And so if a bank performs this assessment exercise and finds that it needs uh, to allocate some capital uh, to cover climate risks. This is discussed with the supervisor, and then a uh, supervisor may question it, may, may require improvements and everything, so that they reach a common ground and establish a, a, an amount of capital that would, be, would have to be allocated considering uh, climate risk uh, in pillar two. Thank you so much, Emmanuel and David, for clarifying uh, both from Brazil and Europe's perspective. Uh, there is a follow-on question now um, in terms of risk. So, um, the, so the participant asks, in terms of the vectors through which climate risks are most likely to turn up uh, consistently in the near future for central banks, do you expect to see the most impact first in terms of inflation effects economic growth effects or financial stability effects? Um, so, Emmanuel, would you like to first uh, answer? Yes, Sanjay, um, of course. Um, ah, it's a complicated question because uh, uh, we might not know what will turn up uh, first and more uh, with the most uh, important impact. Uh, what I can say, uh, maybe, is to uh, state uh, that, uh, you know, we have some uh, vintage for the NGFS scenarios uh, every, uh, like, every two years, if I don't mistake, around. Uh, there would be a new one uh, coming in the, you know, following uh, weeks. Um, and here we have, a, a, according also to... Uh, the IPCC evolution, because as you know, our scenarios are, are based on IPCC uh, assessment. Uh, the damage function, which impacts so the macroeconomics, the uh, GDP evolution, uh, will be um, reinforced uh, in the different scenarios, uh, which means uh, more damage, which means uh, a transition transition scenarios so, uh, and uh, uh, risk uh, and physical risks, physical shocks, which uh, might have more impact, we consider more impact than uh, what was in the previous vintage. So that's a little bit of a, because of the IPCC uh, evolution. So that's for to come. It's not already public, so just for your uh, uh, knowledge, but there's a little bit of a strengthening uh, in the air in this regard. Uh, we have also started to get to the right tools in order to measure the uh, inflationary or disinflationary impact of the transition according to the different scenarios. And uh, for what is its internal work in Banque de France, which is still undergoing, uh, but um, the um, 
impacts that we consider as more likely are uh, more in higher inflation perspectives than lower inflation perspectives because there was a possibility according to the transition pathways, according to uh, some uh, hypothesis, possibility that it could come to with a lower uh, inflation. We consider that according to the fact that transition using a lot of, uh, uh, of um, uh, assets which certainly will have to uh, get more expensive. Also, uh, considering other aspects, it might be more inflationary than deflationary. Uh, and as far as financial stability, if we manage well, and that's we try, what we try to do uh, with uh, both the regulatory and the supervisory approach, we should manage to uh, 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 ensure that the financial stability developments uh, that we know uh, and for the source of risks that we know uh, could be uh, handled correctly if we have the right governance and we have if we maintain the right and develop the right tools. Thanks, David, over to you. Well, I haven't thought about this, this, uh, the, this event now, how can you, what would happen first? I tend to believe that the, the real sector will be the first to be affected for, uh, with climate uh, uh, risk events. On the first, and then it will be transmitted to the financial sector, in the means of, of defaults and and uh, everything. But uh, from the central bank perspective, as Emmanuel said, we must be ready to uh, exert our power as as uh, financial regulators and supervisors, and try at most to to, to avoid uh, the, the these effects uh, reaching the the. The financial sector. So I think the financial stability would be the last uh, to be to, to 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 have the effects of uh, these events of of climate uh, risks, you know, transition risk, and 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 physical risk as well. Thanks, David. In some ways, we've been seeing the inflationary effect play out, which has got to do with uh, you know shocks to the real economy. In any case, of climate change, and you're right. It could really begin with the real economy and then translate into financial stability effects. Uh, there is a next question, which is uh, specifically on Europe. So, Emmanuel, um, how do you think the capital markets union in the Europe uh, will contribute to transition investment gap? As reports suggest that the CMU will fail to support a uh, green transition, why not introduce monetary policy tools to support transition di directly, such as green TLTROs? So what's, uh, any views on that? Um, so I, I would like to a little bit disagree about the, uh, you know, uh, a little bit of a, a position where uh, we have not started yet on the CMU and it would fail anyhow and it's of no use to, to get uh, involved and to develop it further. Um, I've made a long, uh, you know, development on green securitization and that's part of the uh, things that we want to develop uh, in the context of the Capital Markets Union. Uh, we consider that uh, there is a lot of things in order to uh, um, to ensure that the um, you know excess savings of the private sector in Europe um, is attracted enough uh, from an investment perspective on the adequate uh, investment support, and we consider that there is a. a maybe we could have a very beneficial development of venture capital in Europe, which is uh, lagging behind a lot uh, behind uh, in the US or elsewhere. Uh, we have a, um, a, a liability structure in Europe for NFCs, for non-financial corporates, which, is, uh, which gives a lot of room to uh, debt and too little to capital. So we want to uh, balance better things. Uh, and we consider that we could manage by developing some tools which would be uh, public-private 
uh, initiatives in order to incentivize um, uh, uh, capital raising via venture capital. So we have a lot of things to uh, to be done in terms of uh, capital market union, including from a very operational perspective, from a Banque de France perspective, which is to say we have a lot of different markets, you know, uh, trading venues, a lot of different uh, financial market infrastructures like uh, 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 CSDs uh, and other uh, CCPs, which help uh, in order to make the settlement of the different financial transa transactions. It's quite fragmented. And maybe we should aim at... Uh, you know, uh, taking the advantage of uh, new technologies like the DLT in order to help uh, you know, build um, a, a new infrastructure which would be completely shared among the different uh, stakeholders of the uh, whole uh, value chain, uh, which would be uh, notably aimed at facilitating the issuance of green bonds or linkers, you know, sustainable uh, linked bonds, uh, because there's a lot of information to uh, uh, take into account and it's still very cumbersome and maybe technology and uh, you know, market trading uh, and post-market technologies uh, could help in this regard and we might help with uh, tokenization and uh, blockchain technology. Um, since this being said, uh, the monetary policy, um, you know, uh, can what it can bring. It can bring uh, a lot of value. Uh, we have already uh, uh, I've already developed on the macroeconomics of climate. That's one part for the stance, but also from an operational perspective, we have already since 2022 developed a framework in order to tilt our, uh, you know, corporate bond purchase that we have handled in the context of quantitative easing, which have, you know, uh, um, which have ended uh, now. But we know how to uh, give a little bit of a bonus uh, to the issuers which contribute to the transition and to give a little bit of a malus to the ones uh, who are lagging behind. And we can do that. So that's a technology that we have developed, that we have implemented, and we ha which have changed things, huh? uh, which uh, just to be very blunt, we have stopped purchasing some issuers uh, and uh, um, strengthened the purchase of uh, other uh, corporate bonds, uh, more aligned with uh, Paris-based objectives. Uh, we can develop that for the collateral framework always with the objective to protect the euro system balance sheet versus the risks uh, of climate change. So that's a little bit uh, of a uh, well, risk-minded uh, uh, perspective, but it uh, allows to uh, show to the other stakeholders in the financial system that it is possible to tilt things, to change things, and that they could replicate exactly the same from an asset management perspective for their own operations. And we do that not only for monetary policy, but also for the uh, management of our own funds or the funds which are backed by the uh, pension uh, fund uh, in Banque de France. So it's quite like uh, 22 billion euros, uh, which are already aligned uh, on the Paris objectives. Uh, when it comes to corporate bonds and, uh, of course, uh, stocks. Thanks, Emmanuel. And we have the last six minutes, so I'm going to um, raise the question which David can perhaps try and answer on, um, on basically asking that, you know, when it comes to increasing global climate financial flows from advanced economies to global south, how can central banks uh, help address currency exchange risks, which I think has been talked about quite a bit, uh, since these impede the effective deployment of climate capital. And there's also, uh, you know, the challenge of debt sustainability across the region. So David, uh, what can central banks do to mitigate these risks? Well, in terms of uh, exchange uh, uh, risk, uh, says the question, uh, central banks can, uh, 
uh, require uh, proper management of, the, of these risks. Uh, we have the, the country risk and the transfer risk, which are linked to this uh, uh, exchange risk. But uh, there's, there's, all, there's all a central bank can do because the, the flow of capital from uh, a developed country to the global south from a, a perspective of a central bank, which is in the south, there are the the some uh, any imp impediment to this flow comes uh, may should be uh, treated on the on the on the on the other side, the developed side, not on the on the on the on the, on the, on the jurisdiction that receives the, the these resources. And so, uh, what central banks can do is uh, put in place adequate uh, measures to uh, give a, a treatment to this this country risk, the risk that uh, uh, resources driven to a country uh, could could result in a loss, and transfer risk, uh, which is all uh, which is the risk that uh, the the. The bank cannot. The, the country cannot uh, pay back the, the the perform its its obligations because of some capital uh, uh, capital constraint, so to say. Thank you, David. Um, just uh, four minutes to go, and it would be nice to have some uh, last sort of word or from you, Emmanuel, David, and then Zach. Um, you know, sort of wrap up on the takeaways that you have from this panel and about your report before we conclude. So, Emmanuel, over to you. Uh, maybe uh, just um, one last word on a thing I didn't address in the last question on TLTROs, uh, you know, the credit, uh, long term credit operations of the euro system. We consider um, that's for now, not the adequate tool to, to develop more and more in, in order to have a more risk-based approach because TLTROs is more like a budgetary uh, instrument, uh, like um, which would be more appropriate in the uh, remit of the government. So not to mix different instruments, not to have a lot of, to avoid a little bit of a fiscal dominance uh, in this regard. Um, so that's, just to close the question, because I didn't make the, uh, the complete uh, um, answer. My perspective um, for as a final word is that uh, I'm, I must admit that I'm, uh, we still have, we have to be very humble because we have done a lot in a time frame which is uh, for the, you know, the normal time scale of central bank is very little. It's a, a very small time frame because we started like seven years ago, which is not a lot of years uh, compared to uh, you know, uh, a normal monetary uh, uh, vision. Uh, and we have done huge things uh, in such a little time. Uh, we have to uh, ensure that it is there. That we and we have we are quite confident that now it's completely streamlined into our different mandates. And uh, just to tell you one figure, uh, out of the research economic research in Banque de France, it's more like it's more than twenty percent of the research which is dedicated to climate and nature. Which is quite huge. It was well. It was uh, it would have been a, a completely weird figure uh, like uh, ten to fifteen years ago. So we have completely changed uh, the way we work. Uh, it's mainstreamed. We have to uh, develop further some tools, uh, but we perform very good uh, uh, achievements each year. Additionally, uh, even collectively at the NGFS level, but also individually in each central bank. And now we have to uh, uh, get- I'm just conscious of time. The same dynamic on nature. That's the very key word. Be, be as dynamic, be as ambitious on nature, even though it's a little bit more complicated. 
Sorry. Thank you so much. No, thank you so much, Emmanuel. David, over to you on your concluding thoughts. No, very quickly, I would like to, to, to praise this endeavor of Scorecard to, uh, of assessing and uh, disclosing and ranking countries in their efforts to, to address this, this issue, the climate issue, the climate risk issue. And this will uh, uh, give us opportunity to discuss uh, and in the G20. And it, it goes in the same spirit of the Pillar 3 in the Basel uh, uh, framework, that uh, disclosure of information is good for for comparison and for trying to achieve to 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 improve your your position. So it's very good. It's a very good effort. Thanks, David. Zach, any um, last thoughts? <clears throat> yes. Um, uh, so just uh, thanks very much, uh, Emmanuel and David, um, and Sir and Jai for your um, for this. Um, and yeah, my my closing thoughts are. Um, uh, really, really, just to like, um, like emphasize that the the leading central banks on this edition of the scorecard um, are showing that green central banking can be done. You know, it is uh, not the case um, that there's a sort of mainstream consensus that central banks can shy away and uh, supervisors can shy away from these issues. Which, like, I think you know, institutions like the Federal Reserve, which we've talked about, are kind of hide behind this kind of idea of we're neutral, we don't need to think about it, it's, it's in the hands of the government, like these sorts of things. Um, and what's really positive to see is the progress that has been made, and we hope that that momentum can continue um, uh, into uh, through the year and then into 2025 and beyond. Thanks, Zach, um, for that lovely report. <laughs> And thank you, Emmanuel and David, for being uh, great panelists and for sharing your insights with us. And whoever's joined, I'd urge you to read the report. It's extremely insightful. Um, and uh, best of luck uh, for next year. And I look forward to seeing everyone uh, again. Thank you so much. Thank you very Insight much. And inspiring. So thank you for all the recommendations as well. <laughs> thank you, too. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Goodbye. Bye.